Shalom, my wonderful Havarim at Narkis. This is your old friend Lois to Berberg. Uh, we have been doing these Bible studies on Luke for quite a while now, and, and I guess Narkis has been doing this for, I don't know, 50 plus years or something, and uh, I am uh, one of the many who have been blessed by these uh, nerdy uh, pursuits. This is, I get, I'm just explaining for a person who's tuning in for the first time that Narkis in Jerusalem has been a place where a lot of graduate students and scholars, uh, Jewish and Christian, come and sometimes and want to discuss the gospels and uh and the bible and we have been having bible studies we meaning they have been doing these for decades and now uh because of covid um uh we can participate by zoom which is exciting and so i have been honored to be a part of this and actually to speak at these um, you, uh, you'll see I've done a few before, and usually I'm in my little home office with tons of books. I, right now I am sitting in my uh, niece's bedroom, so and she likes blue, and so you see the beautiful blue background behind there. So anyhow, uh, I'm on location, not that anybody cares, but anyhow, um, so we're speaking around the world today, and we are studying a passage in Luke that, um, that is familiar to many of us, and, and I'm going to, I'll start with that passage, and we're going to chew that over today, um, discuss uh, nerdy, scholarly insights on context, Where's Jesus coming from? His, the both his Bible, his the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures he read. What was being said about it during his time? What was said about it afterwards? And Hebrew and Greek, all of those little uh, ideas. But then we're going to dig in and say, how does it impact how I live today? Of course. And what was he's saying to us, okay? Um, and our passage, you're waiting. So what are we actually studying, Lois? Okay, our passage is uh, Luke eleven thirty three 33 through 36. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a, a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having in no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Okay, sounds a little familiar. And if uh, you are reading that uh, for the first time without a lot of contextual knowledge, if you're uh, like many of us, you're, you're, you might be scratching your head about what really is he getting at about your eye is your lamp is a lamp and eyes being healthy and your light and bad and darkness and you're saying what and you're, you're whispering to your friends or you're just like I don't get it I don't get it right of course but if you are blessed by having David Biven, who is one of our lovely participants tonight, teach you. Um, and so I have to say this all, I have to give credit to my, my Rebbe, 
my uh, David taught, is the one who is ultimately the source of um, many of these good insights. All the wrong ones were not from him. Huh. And uh, um, <laughs> excuse me, he would say to you, the problem is that you need to understand Jewish idioms. And it's a language issue. It, it, uh, it's not just that Jesus is being extra, uh, extra poetic here. This is a language issue. So we're going to look at some language issues. Um, the, the fact that idioms, uh, you know, idiom is a play on words. And idioms can be, they say, transparent, like they're so obvious you can just figure them right out, uh, or they can be opaque, meaning there's no way you're going to guess. Like um, the, if you say the uh, man kicked the bucket, how do you translate kick the bucket into French? You can't. It's yeah, kicking and buckets. If you say, I'm going to do a word study on kick and on bucket, and then I'll think of them, and then I will understand kicking the bucket. You're not going to get it, right? Okay. No, it's what about ra raining cats and dogs? You betcha. There are things that make zero sense in one language, but they're familiar in the next. And so we're going to look at that. Okay. And, uh, and what I'm, we're going to be in it is this, and it is Jesus' words about the eye. Okay. And I'm going to, what we need to do to give us a clue about, we're, our essential goal is to look at the Luke passage here, but there are actually two passages in Matthew that are going to help us. And so let's look at those two passages, and we're going to dig into the first Okay. Uh, okay. Mm, let's. So you turn to. Oops. Uh, Matthew six twenty two. Okay. Okay. Matthew six twenty two. The eye is the lamp of the body. That sounds familiar. So if your eye is healthy. And this is ESV translation. Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Okay, that's one passage in Matthew. Hang on, we're going to come right back. But I just want to point out there is another passage in Matthew that Luke, that is, is a clue and keep that, you pull it in, and we'll talk about that later. But um, just to put it in your notes, it's Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give your uh, glory to your Father in heaven. Okay? So, so our tools are for understanding this Luke passage. I'm going to say uh, uh, great tools are going to come from these two Matthew passages of what is he saying there. Okay? So let's look at... Matthew 6.22, okay? The eye is the lamp of the body. And you're going, eyes, lamps, and your eye is bad. What's going on here? Okay, everybody's tracking here with me. I'm, I'm going to just, this is not a promotional statement, but I wrote a chapter about this in a book that is called Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. <laughs> so um, so re for reference, if anybody has seen this, and it, it is called, let's see, 
um, gaining a good eye. Okay. You could give me the page number to simplify okay, my sure, life. Sure, sure. This is, I've got the heart. I think the pages are the same. Page 69. I don't think you can see that. Gaining a good eye. If so, if you want to, if you have this book, uh, uh, or if you, if you're interested, gain, uh, that's where I write a whole chapter on it. So, okay. Okay. So. No, we, it's not doing a plump for her books. No. But they're well <laughs> worth getting. And if anybody's around, I've got most of them sitting down here in quantity. <laughs> and you can, failing that, you can order them from Lois. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you for Thank that. You. There you go. Thank Gemma, you. if you're in Jerusalem, you buy them from Gemma. If you're in America, you buy them from me. Okay, that's not it. Sorry, that was totally uh, a little... Sorry. <laughs> and all okay. of you have them in Dutch. And there are, they are in Dutch. They are in uh, Yes. So, that's right. Um, okay. So, let's beam in. Actually, okay. Ultimately, we're going to be talking about this good eye passage, uh, the, which we're going to start. We're going to have that discussion about there is a Jewish idiom about having a good eye versus a bad eye. And we're going to get there in just one minute. I actually would like to back up a little bit because the Luke passage does have a few more motifs in it. And we're going to um, look at some of those other things because we're going to come back to those later. And, it, and it's about, let's look at the the ideas of the lamp and eyes, the eye, and remembering that along with idioms not really making sense between languages, um, people, we tend to assume that when we hear something that's used metaphorically, like Jesus talks about Herod is that fox, we tend to assume we automatically know what a metaphor is going to be like. Well, if he's a fox, he's clever, because that's how we think. Metaphors in other languages do not always have the same equivalents. And so it's useful to look at how, or how is a lamp, what's a lamp? Ner, ner, okay? How, how many of you know the word lamp in Hebrew? Raise your hand, okay. No, no. Uh, I'm going to chuck in plenty of Hebrew words, but I don't, ex you know, it's okay. No, no tests. Um, let's, I want to point out that in some places that it's not quite being used the way we think of it or that it has more ideas behind it. And we're going to bring those in at the end as we're looking at what does it mean about us being uh, the light of the world or lamps or whatever. Okay. Um, so let's look at interesting passages that have lamp in them. Um, one that you um, might even, that you might even, uh, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light into my path. Obviously, it's guidance. It's the thing that tells you which way to go, of course. Uh, sometimes, so sometimes it is used uh, like uh, for the, here's Proverbs 24, 20 verses and important. For the evil man has no future and the lamp of the wicked will be put out. So sometimes lamp is kind of like uh, your light, your, you'll be, okay? So you can see that it doesn't necessarily mean light. It can mean more like life or something like that. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching his innermost parts, okay? Lamp, lamp of the Lord. Here's, here are a couple of interesting ones. 
there is a scene in 2 Samuel 21 uh, after David comes out and decides to fight a battle um, alongside of his men and his men are like, ah, oh, you know what? It's really a, not a good idea for you, you to be duking it out with your enemies right on the front lines because it's really dangerous. It's kind of like, okay, for all you Star Trek fans, you know how Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock always beam down so that they can have fist fights with the Klingons? Stop doing that because you're going to get killed, right? Okay, and in the same way, his men say, you shall no longer go out with us to battle for you will quench the lamp of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Near, you will quench uh, near Israel. And uh, you, what, what are you catching? What do you assume they mean by that? Anybody? You, well, you'll get killed. And I see it as the lamp of Israel is like the leadership or the, you know, the Lord has put him in place of the one who is the direction that they're going in. It's almost like, you know, the queen the of... Verse. Have you got the verse there in 2 yeah. Samuel 21? Sure. Uh, verse 16. 2 Samuel 21, 16. You know, the queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, she'll talk about, she's They'll talk about the crown. The crown, she's, the crown is almost separate from her. Uh, the crown. She's the, you know, Queen Elizabeth is a person, but the crown is a thing that's the leadership of England. And the same way the lamp of Israel is the, the king who's guiding Israel, at least here. Yeah, here and, it is. The, you're right. Here it is the king, isn't it? Yeah. He's the and leader. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you'll find several places where, um, okay, 1 Kings 15. This is Solomon walked in sin like his fathers did and his heart was not devoted to the Lord. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But for David's sake, God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem setting his son after him because of what David did that was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, and so you'll find several places where it talks about the, uh, the lamp of David. And this actually becomes a messianic image. Um, you'll find rabbinic where they talk about the Messiah as the lamp. So it's a interesting, the lamp of David. And, and you think of... Um, um, we're going to look at in Isaiah later about where it talks about make you a light to the nations. So, hmm, hmm, I'm trying to light your lamps here that you're chewing this over with me, okay? So, um, what, what, you, what you're doing mm -hmm. is really unpacking metaphors mm -hmm. and you haven't really dealt no. with idiom. Is that no, it? we're going to get there. Okay. Totally. Yes, we're, we're on our way. I want to do this one because we can come back to it. And okay. it's cool when you come back to it. I didn't, but I didn't want to interrupt the good eye until we got to there. So that's why we're doing it this way. Yes. Okay. Hey, can and, you explain the, the, the one in Kings with David? I'm, I'm not catching under what that okay. One means. Okay. Okay. I've got here um, the. Um, the passage in 2 Samuel 21, 16. Um, oh, there it's clear. Okay. Uh, I've just, I can, I can pull up the passage. I just have one line right now. Then okay. David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go out with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Uh Meaning that if David gets killed, Israel has no guidance. Is that, do you see what I mean? Captain Kirk should not beam down to fight the Klingons because Starship Enterprise does not have anyone to tell it where to go next. <laughs> so right. The, the first king's what? 15 4 1. Oh, first king. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That, okay. 
And I think it was verse 16, at least in the English for the second Samuel passage. Oh, okay, yes. you're right. Okay, and you're right. And it is not exactly the same connotations there. It says, okay, for verse four says, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. You're right. And, and, and what's, so let's chew that over. What does that mean? A lamp in Jerusalem. Sun. <clears throat> a sun to rule. A sun to rule. It's a kind of a, I guess you could say it's an ongoing presence. In, it's, um, it's what, if you link it with the verse before, he, okay. whoever he was, I can't remember now, walked yeah. in all the sins of his father, which he'd done before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Adonai, his God, like the heart of his father, David. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. I've got nevertheless in my English, nevertheless, for David's sake, Adonai, his God, gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. In other words, there was a continuation of the line. Yeah. It's like in contrast to having your lamp snuffed out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sense another, of that. another possible translation could be when I look at the translation in 2 Samuel 21, mm -hmm. it's translated here as you are the hope of Israel. Oh. And um, oh. in that sense, in your mm -hmm. verse, uh, David also can have a hope in Jerusalem. Hope is nice. Hope is nice. Yeah, that's interesting. But it, it's interesting that the Hebrew word is near. Lamp, yeah. which is lamp, but, yeah. but and so maybe, maybe light gives hope, and there's a yeah. well, there's a connection between the two in the meaning. Yeah. yeah, so that's interesting that how they translate it, and you're gonna see these. Oh, that word is actually near, and yet they're translating it as hope instead of. So that's a good way. That's a good thing to learn. Okay, Lois, oh, yeah. the word can also be used for a song, a mm. psalm. Uh, really? It's, yeah, it's it's a little broader. Maybe okay a light mm -hmm. obviously but yeah it, it's broader it can be a song or a song it can be a song interesting yeah well, and it the can word, the word near can be a song right is that what you're okay. saying you'll see Johnny? right mm -hmm. interesting i uh, anytime you guys want to chuck in something please oh, yes also Sorry? a memorial that's that's oh. you know near uh, sure. near david Near. It is a memorial to David, a song oh, of really? David. Oh, right, uh, yeah. Second Samuel chapter 1, this, ah. the dirge of David. Okay, okay, very interesting. Okay, very interesting. So now we, um, um, okay, very good. And I should probably uh, stop with, not do too many more things with this just because we have many other things to do. I wouldn't want to point out the, one of the most important places is in an ultimate it's kind of the ultimate bing, bingo is revelation 21 23 and there's this passage where the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of the lord gives it light and its lamp is the lamb so ultimately it's going to be a messianic image and the picture of the light that shines in the world is the lamb who we all know is christ and um uh, to me what i get fascinated by is we get you know i'm a coming from a traditional christian background where you get all the punch lines you know jesus is the light of the world you hear it all from the new testament and you don't realize it's all coming from his scriptures and so to me it's like oh how cool is that that's where we're coming from and that's why i like to see the whole flow and that's why i'm doing so much with this whole flow is to go oh this is the the lamp that david that god promised david would have oh so i get all that's why i keep i go broad and i have to show you all of these cool things that are kind of flowing back and forth okay Interesting okay. in the revelation is that here we have the literal meaning of lamp, the function, meaning <laughs> the light. The light, exactly. Yeah. And you can, you bet, it can just mean light, like light. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's come back. Oh, good. I have, I've used a little time, but now we got to come back and look at the main, main, main part of it. Let's look at how um, 
um, the eye is the lamp of the body, Matthew 6, 22. Okay. And I'm just going to give you a, a gimme on the eye. <laughs> and we're going to see it plenty of times is uh, in Hebrew, your eye, your eye really means your outlook on others. Or, you know, it will talk about it, uh, um, it was good in his eyes to do this. You'll find a, a million places, and we're going to see a million passages where you're going to see that your eye is your outlook on others, okay? Um, and this passage, okay, um, our, our main hypothesis is that, um, that two, what Jesus is speaking about is uh, uh, two idioms that were used in Hebrew in the first century, and, uh, the, uh, and it is to have a ein tova which is a good eye, or an ein ra, a bad eye. Okay, or ra, -a. we'll have a, probably we could talk about the fine points and I'm not gonna get into the super details, but, um, and when you, and this idiom is not obvious, what would you think it means to have a good eye if you don't know what hit good eye it's to do with generosity. That's, you know, I would never have guessed that. Um, but yes, I, it is to, to have a good eye is to be generous. To have a bad eye is to be stingy. I think this um, is a, a good example where people just read it and don't know. And they just say, well, good eye people are optimists. And they're the glasses half, the glasses yeah. half full. And yeah. uh, they, yeah. they just have a positive outlook and they, they see the best in everybody. Yeah, that's it. If you if your outlook is good, you're sunny and everything is so cheery for you. And you can find all sorts of Bible commentaries where, oh, and then there's one lady, she's like, the inner eye of it's my chakra. And she's, you know, ah. so their whole books have been written about your inner eye. You see that your one is rubbish. Uh -huh. and, and what does this passage mean to you? Ooh. And what does this passage mean to you? Yes. We can pull all of our ideas and they're all equal. Yes, yes. If you and we're all as ignorant as each other if we go down that line, aren't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you pretty much come up with anything. Yes. And, and if so... You go, can, if you go, go far it. enough down, down under, good eye is just a greeting. Really? Really? Yeah, I suppose. Okay, there you go. Well... Um, you can, I got, you can just I got read the... You can just read the translations in English. Mm -hmm. and have where you mouth. have, and what were you going to say, David? I, just, I said, you don't have to ask uh, the man on the street. You can just read all the major English translations. And none sure. of them got it right. And they're all kind of off. If, and if your eyesight is good, your whole body will be full of light, <laughs> for instance. I have seen sermons where we just should be thankful for our eyesight. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a translation when your eye is healthy, which means about the same. Yes. It's about the, the, the condition of the eye. When you, when you have a healthy eye, you can look good. Yes. And, but they, yeah. but they, didn't, they didn't think about why eye and not eyes. Right. And, and, and it is specifically single. What David is referring to is that your eye the word there, ophthalmos, it's not plural, it's single. And um, that's one clue that we're dealing with an idiom because it's, the idioms are wooden. They tend not, you, you, when you're talking about the, uh, if you say the man kicked the bucket, to make it in plural, you'd say, okay, the guy kicked the bucket. The guys, do they kick the buckets? Do you put a S on the end of, no, you, you still say kick the bucket. It's, it's like the phrase becomes kind of 
set in place in the same way when you find idioms about the eye, they don't plural, you, they're very wooden. And so that's one clue of what, that this is not normal and it's weird in Greek too, right, David? That's right. So, um, the, um, what I don't understand is why don't translators, um, you know, take idioms <laughs> and make, I mean, I'm just reading the message. It says, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills with the light. If you live oh twenty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body, body is a dank cellar. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and, you, and you will have a dark life. Now, so my big question is, yeah, we can't expect, I mean, most people are going to read translations and yeah. they need to have trust in their translations. Yeah. How can all of these English translators miss translating yeah. idioms correctly? I, I'll, tell you why. Tell you, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because they don't know Hebrew and they're trans, trying to translate the Greek. Yeah. But for the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, you have to put the Greek back into Hebrew and that they can't do. On the other hand, to give you some trust, uh, I, did a I had a college on the, the principle of translation. And when you have an original word and you want to translate it, there may be more possibilities of words in the other language which have a part of the meaning in common. And so there can be five words in English which have some in common with the original word. Right, yeah. Uh, that's why it's interesting to compare translations so that you get all the aspects something of the aspects of yeah. the original word and then we're talking about Greek into English and, not, right. and behind that then you have to step down to Hebrew right. so that's a right. complex uh, process it is not it's not simple exactly and it's not like what's I what I find interesting is when I actually read you know the commentaries people the, there are often little asterisks. They'll say, "This is probably about this. Probably is about generous generosity," and it, people know it. But the people who write the commentaries are not necessarily the people who did the translation, and so you get kind of these odd. And they're really trying very hard to make this work, and so uh, you get some poor translations. But but also you have to, to see it in yeah. context. In one yeah. uh, context, uh, the light mm -hmm. may mean something else in Hebrew, from Hebrew, yeah. right. as it does in another context. The, the meaning is yeah. moving around with the yeah. context. That's right. And that's right. You need to have a sense of, exactly, and you need to kind of stay close to that passage. You know, New Testament, how is it used, how, how is it phrased? Let's look at other places, and let's see. Okay. It's the, the issue is not entirely translation. I mean, I've got, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, okay, I've got the, the eyes, the lamp of your body. I mean, and that's what yeah. most of the good translations have. I mean, yeah. I think the message is, I mean, the message is wonderful for different reasons. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in comparing that. But if you go on, Gemma, if you go on to the next sentence, it says, so if your eye is something, question. Yeah, I've got when your eye is healthy, your whole body right. is full of Healthy, be healthy, right. sound. Uh, right. Let's, we, what I'm simply saying is that the dilemma yeah. comes for the preacher who's mm -hmm. not really saying, listen, this, this situation, this phrase is very odd. What is an idiom? What is, or even if you don't understand Hebrew, go yeah. back and check it out, like you've just done, Lois. Go back and yeah. have a look and Wait. see what Wait. eyes are and where it Got comes from. Yeah. Instead and of making a whole story on, you know, make sure you've had your eyes tested regularly and give thanks to the Lord for your good, good news. Uh, yeah, right. There you go. Can I, and let me pull us is, in. Let's, let's, let, I need to, I want to, I want to keep us going so that we don't digress so much. I know we can talk about idioms and, but I do have to point out that this, there, this, it, there is a, 
asterisk here. This is not as simple problem as just good eye, bad eye, and we could just read it. We just because the word here in Greek or uh, in this passage is not what you might think. It might be kalos. You know, his ophthalmos is kalos. That would mean eye is good. That would be obvious. It's not that. And I should point out Yoni Garish, who's on my screen too, he has written an article about this. And so, but I have been, we've all been working on this. And so um, that word is not good. So that makes, that's part of the reason when you say, why are those dumb translators missing it? It's because it's not quite as simple as you think, but we're going to look at um, the word there is aplotes, which is that, am I close enough? To, some of us know Greek. I know David can like, yeah, he knows how to pronounce. Okay. Aplotes. You're like, okay, that word, aplotes, Greek is, um, it means, uh, it's used in parallel with diplotes. Um, aplotes is to be single. Diplotes is to be double. To be a single-minded person is to be, a, if you speak singly or simply or sincerely, you speak with one mouth and you are, uh, you're, you're speaking a single message. You're not, you're not divided and you're not sneakily saying something that is, uh, is uh, you say one thing and you mean another. And so to be, so you'll, you'll find it many places um, in, like in the Septuagint, you'll find it often translating the word for sincere, that they were sincere because they were single, okay? That they were pure or yashar, they were tom, yashar, single in, in the sense of simple, that they have a, a single wholeheartedness for God, okay? Uh, aplotes. That's, you find that in some translations, you never hear it, it doesn't just mean single, like one. It doesn't mean only, it means single, and it has a kind of a moral connotation of that you're single-hearted, that um, as opposed maybe to single, double. With an eye, maybe single as being focused. Well, you could say that, I suppose. Focused, yeah. Sincere. sincere. Honestly, sincere is how it's used in the Old Testament. But, and I did a search on how is aplotes used in the New Testament, really interestingly, so that it often is used, aplotes means generous. Ooh, it's a Greek idiom that means generous. And you can find it like in, um, okay, Okay, um, Paul likes to use it, um, Romans 12.8, um, he's saying, um, this is just got part of this here, the one, the one, um, let's skip that one, 2 Corinthians 9, and he's talking to the people who support him about their money and the fact that they're giving money to him. And he says like 2 Corinthians 9, 11, you will be enriched in every way to be aplotes. Aplotes in every way. And th through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Okay, and then a couple verses later, um, by the approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the aplotes of your contribution for them and all others. So this sincere, this word aplotes is actually being used to mean generosity, sincerity, generosity. Um, okay, if I, what is, so this is my hypothesis. Sometimes it's used for sincerity. Sometimes it's used for generosity. My 
theory is that the reason why Matthew uses it in the Gospels is because Jesus is saying good eye in Hebrew. And it doesn't, good eye does not make sense to Greeks if you said ophthalmos kalos. And so what he does is he uses a generous eye. He puts in aplos because it's an, it, it is now a Greek idiom. He's replacing a Hebrew idiom with a Greek idiom because they're already used to, they know that that word doesn't quite mean what it, they're using it. Um, that's personally my theory is why he is doing that. Partly so because- saying, Lois, I'm trying to disentangle that. Okay. The, the Hebrew idiom, Yeah. I have always understood to mean generosity. Right, or, yes. Or meanness or stingy, the opposite. Yep. But what you're saying is that if you put it into the Greek, yeah. the implication is the Greek also has an idiom which actually means the same thing. Because in the Corinthians text you gave us, I've got generosity and overflowing with thanksgiving and so on. Yeah. It's the same idea. It's, so it's very interesting that the Greek idiom actually works out the same. It's, they have a different word that idiomatically means generous. Right. And so they're, he's explaining the one, let's, but let's look at, yes, um, yes, let's back up and look at where good eye is being used in Hebrew, because my hypothesis, Jesus is saying good eye and bad eye, and let's look at how it is used in the scriptures, Okay. And what I can see is that the Greeks can't, it doesn't work in Greek. And so you can see the Greeks trying to figure out how do you explain it. Um, the first place where we find good eye or bad eye is actually in Deuteronomy 15, verse 9. Okay. Are you guys all still tracking? on my wild and crazy uh, figure wheel. This is a little adventure we are taking together here, okay? Deuteronomy 15, nine says, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. And you say the seventh year, the seventh, the year of release is near. And this is how my translation puts it. And your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing. I've got your eye is evil against your poor uh -huh. so Your eye is. Mm -hmm. it's, that's a direct translation, in effect, of the idiom. It, it, here, I'll read it. Uh -huh. Let me read it. The Hebrew says, the ra'a aincha be achicha ha avion. And bad is your eye to your brother who is poor. And bad, it, you see how it's very clear that in Deuteronomy, to have a bad eye to your brother is to be stingy, right? This is very clear that bad eye means stingy in this passage. Very clear, very clear. Yeah. And that what's interesting is that in the Septuagint, they actually do say ponero, they, they call it bad eye. They know what that means, the Septuagint translators, okay? They said ponero, ophthalmos, ponero. I'm not going to do the Greek because I'm not, a, I'm not a, I do a little bit of Hebrew, not so much Greek. And David will cringe. I know you need to know all your languages, but it's interesting that the Septuagint understands, just renders it as is, is that everybody knows what a bad eye is. And it's clear from this passage, it means stingy okay and the whole context is is, is that yes and it's not just one verse out of the blue then he'll you know mm -hmm. you must surely give and whatever and this thing will bless you in all your work and in all your undertaking you know i mean whatever yeah. it's, it's the whole context of what it is to give yeah have we got, have we got any more yes we've got more uh, hebrew script references Yes, we let's go to Proverbs twenty-two. Um, we we gen these passages. Yes, let's. Okay, Lois, just briefly, yeah. 
you're saying in the Septuagint that poneros is not communicating stingy. It's just communicating bad or evil. Is that the word, it literally, it in, in Greek, poneros means bad. Right. Bad. So they but can't yet comprehend from their expression that there's an mm -hmm. idiom about mm -hmm. stinginess. Is that yeah. what you're saying? That's, and we're going to find a few other places where they are going to change it, and we'll see what they say here, okay? Um, but but verse 9, bountiful I will be blessed. Yes. For he shares his bread with the poor. Is that the one you wanted? Yes, exactly. And you can see um, and listen to listen to it. Um, just it says, tov ein, who uh, yevarach. Ki natan mi mi lehamo ledal. Okay, tov ein. It does. It, in our translations, we'll say the man who has a generous eye or he who has a bountiful eye. It's to me. It's just got such a punch in the originalist. Tov ein. Yeah. It's like they've labeled the person tov ein, good eye. He will be blessed because he gives. You can see because of his generosity, you can see that that's what that idiom means there. And it's like it's the very definition of the person, tovain. You are a tovain. You share with your poor. I, I, I think that's very powerful. And it, it, um, I really like hearing the Hebrew and then kind of listening to how the words um, play out. What's interesting is the Greeks, um, Andra. Okay, Andra Ilar I Ilar Ron Kidoten uh Elore Otheos. And what that means is you could it would literally um a man cheerful and giving blessed by God or blessed by God. But they didn't uh the Greeks did not say a man who's generous, they said a man either. It's like the word is hilarious in English. It's a you know cognate, uh, you've, you know, hilarious giver. I don't know if you've heard about that. That's uh, a man who is cheerful and gives will be blessed by God. They the Greeks don't have quite a word to make sense out of good eye, so they say cheerful and giving. So that's what how they talk about this. You're talking about the Septuagint, are you? Yes, the Septuagint. The Septuagint is trying to explain that by right. saying cheerful and giving. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, okay. But we can see that obviously, biblically, it's a passage that that is being used. Um. So we do know, and we're going to get to the rabbinic passage. Probably taking too much time. Um. Let's look at. Um, as opposed to Proverbs 22, 6, looking at that one, I probably, I'm going to, for sake of time, we're going to not spend too much time there, but, okay, do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy, <laughs> and um, and look, at, I just love how it's just phrased. Al tilham et lehem ra ein. That means your el tilham et lehem ra ein. It means don't eat the bread of the ra ein, the bad eye. It's just like a, the picture of the person is a ra ein, <laughs> a bad eye. I, it's like his whole life is just, you can just piece that label on top of him, and there he is. That's, that's very, okay. Um, uh, for you, I'll just, what's interesting is that, that the Greek is not going to do ophthalmos paneros here. What they do is baskanos which actually means um, to like a magician who bewitches others and who casts an evil eye upon them. And then the Greek kind of has more of a sense of that you're going to cast a, a envious spell on them. And I think the Greeks are starting to misunderstand 
for what a bad eye is. I'll just. Okay. Okay. Can I can I ask you? Yes. I'm looking at the loop thing again. Yeah. We started with the whole thing about the lamp and the yeah. light. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then it goes to the to the idiom. Right. The lamp is the, the the eye is the lamp of the body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole yeah. body is full of light. Yeah. Which yeah. means yeah. when your eye is when you're generous. Yeah. But I'm trying to bring the whole. I'm trying okay. to put the thing together. I understand, Gemma. I understand. Thank you for that. But I need to get there myself. I okay. know you want to pull us in, but let me do it, okay? I was also okay. watching. The, I was also watching. I know you're the watching time. the time, and so that's fine. Okay. You're. You're. I'm. I'm wise. Okay, that's fine. So let's. So we're. Yes. Um, okay. So we have looked at bad eyes and good eyes and light and dark and everything. And let's bring ourselves back to this passage where we are looking at Jesus talking about, in Hebrew, likely uh, the Ein Tova, which in Greek is hard to translate, and so they say it's a, a sincere eye. They put in a different word. And look at, I love this to me was like such a wow, aha. First, if you look at the Matthew version, you, you see to have a good eye, this passage, um, you might just say it's about your optimism, except then it doesn't help you understand the past. There's a passage before it where it says that is all about being generous to the poor. Uh, it Would says, a friendly eye be a, an, an option as a translation? A friendly I'm sorry. Eye? Could sorry. a friendly eye be an option? Friendly an eye? Option? Well, that's nice. Yes, that's fine. That would work. A friendly eye, you know, it's an outlook that cares about others. And I'm going to get to the take home bingo just in about one second. Okay, so we're and we're going to get there and then we can have a good discussion about it. Um, but look, Look at, to me, this was such a cool aha in Matthew, where um, I used to you know, go, I don't get this whole eye lamp deal. And it's all part of this beautiful beatitudes and all these sayings are kind of random until you understand that it's about generosity, uh, about that your eye, your outlook towards others is what guides your life. And if your eye is generous towards others, it's about generosity. Look at what happens if you're reading the passage before it, uh, um, Matthew 16, six, sorry, Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven uh, where neither moth and rust destroy or whether thieves. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Um, this, I don't want to digress. This is often used in terms of giving money to the poor is to lay up your treasure in heaven. There's a, many passages in the Bible and outside of the Bible that always that means to give to the poor. And then look at what is right after Jesus, this passage. No one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Like, ah. So if you get the one passage about being generous towards others, then the whole thing flows together into one big passage. Whoa. And the way I have always understood it, you guys are waiting for, okay, how does this really, um, the way I say is, and I think this will help us kind of look at the eye as your, the lamp of the body and bring it together with the Luke passage is that 
is that your attitude towards helping others, your generosity towards helping others is really a powerful, important, essential statement about your faith in God himself, that it defines you as a person. You are an Ein Tov, <laughs> or Ein, you don't just have one, you are one. Ein Ra, Ra, Ra Ein, that was in Proverbs, and then in the rabbinic, they're going to start saying uh, uh, Ein Tova. Um, to, to be a good eye is to be someone who is so sure in rock that in your depths of your heart is, you know what, I might not be the richest person on earth, I might not have everything going perfect, but you know what, the Lord's taking care of me, and everything will be okay, and I will be generous with others, because I want to, I love others. When you are a Ayn Ra, when you have one, or when you are one, it means Essentially, um, I'm on my own here, and I have to take care of myself, and I must greedily grab onto anything possible because there's no, no one and nothing looking out for me. And so to be, you know, that's the essence of being. Uh, and so if your, your attitude towards Caring and helping for others is ultimately what defines you. Um, I find that very helpful. Is um, uh, Amen. Amen. There you go. And so you can see how your eye, your outlook, is your the lamp of your body. Your that's it. Yes. David. Well, sometimes we have. Uh... Oh, excuse me. Sometimes we have a, um, uh, we can have a good eye out of duty. That's our duty to help people, like uh, not only giving, but uh, like helping a little old lady across the street. That's your duty. Yes. But do we, but do, we do that out of loving kindness? It's yeah. a big difference. I'm, I'm going to do, be, have a good eye out of duty. Duty. I'm gonna have a little old lady across Is the street out bit, of duty. But is my, do you even have a good eye then? You just did I don't think it. that counts unless you do it with love and, and loving, yeah. not just love and kindness. That's two different things, but you have to do it with loving kindness. That's right. Man, you there, can get the reward. There you go. That's good. We, and we, I, I'm going to, I want to bring us last thing, and then let's have a great discussion, is that I want to point out, because remember, we're also, we, we've been, it's cool how it kind of, you know, Jesus is preaching about money in Matthew, but in some sense, when you read Luke uh, and Luke, Luke's version of it, he broadens it out in terms of light and darkness and being members of the kingdom. And I, I and in terms of, you know, that we are the light of the world. If your whole body is full of light, having no part dark it will be wholly bright as with a lamp that gives you light um it's a little bit stronger of a, a, a statement and especially if you're looking at it in terms of the matthew passage uh, matthew 5 14 um you are the light of the world in the same way let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven the thing that I was meditating on is there are, we often talk about in Isaiah, there are these beautiful passages about when the Messiah, the messianic reign of the Messiah is going to come. And it talks about, and the people who dwell in great darkness will see a great light. And uh, he will open the eyes of the blind and bring light to the nation. He'll be a light to the nations. Um, but what's interesting uh, is that there is, in Isaiah 58, where, um, 
where God is, he's frustrated with his people and they're fasting. He doesn't, but he says, you know what? If you pour yourself out for the hunger, hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. And so actually even the people of the Messiah, I mean, the people who respond to this kingdom of light and submit to being part of the reign of light, they themselves, their lives start shining and being a light to, they, they, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like midday. That's Isaiah 58, 10. Um, and it's part of, you know, the Messiah, the Christ reigns in his kingdom by being a light to the nations, but we are his, um, in Daniel, you know, we're going to shine like stars in the brightness, but it's interesting how it's linked to our attitude towards others, whether we are, we are rejoicing in our, how we know he loves and cares for us, paid for our sins and died for us and everything is great and so we pour ourselves out for others or are we stingy <laughs> and like i still have to work oh i can't believe this too life is so hard and i can't do anything for anybody else so i guess that would be my preachable point is is your eye your attitude towards others is how you show the light that uh, the lord has lit in your heart to the rest of the world.